This is the last panel. I'm hoping that everyone is still having some energy for, for the last uh, panel of the day and that will be followed by the last keynote speaker of the day. And we've heard so much about innovation today. And we are going to continue this theme in the panel right now. But before we go to the panel, I would like to share with you the thoughts of a couple of investigators that have dedicated most of their careers to actually do innovation in diagnostics, one of them actually being here with us in the audience, uh, Paloma Tejas. So please, let's watch the video, and in the meantime, I will invite our panel to join me in the stage. This is Joaquin Belmont. I'm a physician, physician scientist. My name is Paloma Cejas. I'm a translational cancer research. I've been dedicated in my, my career to the identification of biomarkers. Biomarkers are in the, all the natural history of the disease since the very beginning until the end. And at each time point, when you start seeing a patient and you need to decide which treatment to give, you need to make a diagnostic. And there, obviously, the pathologies give you the, like, this guy has bladder cancer, but you, you want to know more. Because if the, in the end, if there is any specific targeted therapy or any specific medication, then you want to give the patient the best. Cancer is not just uh, cells on a plate. Cancer is a very complex system where uh, the, the cancer cells are surrounded by stromal cells, uh, inflammatory cells, and all that play uh, a role on the final result. We need to understand that better. We are now doing a, a study trying to identify the markers or the, or the, the biochemical substances that can be found on blood that are telling this patient is responding, he's going to benefit from immunotherapy, or this patient is going to um, like progress and not benefit from immunotherapy. In general, the targeted therapy that is just directed to the cancer cell is not working well because we are not taking in consideration how, how other cells are, are working there. Obviously, these tests need to give you answers immediately. Those, no, those, not to be the, those need to be like uh, cheap, uh, easy to get, and you, you need to get the results in 24, 48 hours. If for some tests, if you have it in two hours, that will be uh, fantastic because you sometimes need to make decisions soon on, on, all, on all the patients. Great. Well, we are joined today here by Andy Beck, CEO of Path AI. Shai Shen Or, Associate Professor at the Technion, Israel Institute of Technology, and Founder and Chief Science Officer of Cytorison. Anthony Filipakis, Chief Data Officer at the Broad Institute and also Venture Partner at Google Ventures. And we have David, David Walt joining us remotely today. David is a Hans Jörg Wyss Professor of Biological Inspired Engineering, Harvard Medical School, and is in the Danaher Scientific Advisory Board. Thank you, David, for joining us. So we've been listening a lot during the day today about the innovations that are required to really advance the, the field of diagnostics. And especially we've been listening about how we need new sensing technologies. We were, we were seeing that and listening to the presentations from the Danaher um, companies. Also how we need to, to improve the speed and how can we advance and, and get the results faster and how the disease context is extremely important so that we can properly interpret those diagnostics. So Shai, I'm gonna start um, asking you, what do you think are the paradigm changing themes that are developing in all these novel technologies, in these emerging technologies? It's a great uh, question, Vanessa, and uh, happy to take a first hit at this. Um, so I, I, I think I, there's two points I'd like to get across. Um, the first is, We've kind of heard a lot of hints from this, uh, especially in the just uh, session now on the sepsis side. Baseline of human disease matters, and our baseline matters. And I think this is an underappreciated uh, concept. Uh, it's, it's basically the shift between thinking about genetics as precision medicine and thinking about other mechanisms, epigenetics, and particularly where we uh, have been working on the immune side uh, of things. So uh, if you look at the, um, the human, uh, the host, if you like, from that perspective and quantify it, you can actually predict much more about what's gonna happen from a diagnostic, with, with both disease severity and, and, and kind of incidence, but also with respect to drug responses. And so quantifying that baseline uh, is key. Uh, we have been studying, basically we've set up with collaboration with Mark uh, Davis at Stanford, the longest running 
uh, study of the immune system uh, at high resolution. So we've been tracking people since 20, uh, 2007, uh, just kind of one year after the other, uh, vaccinating them, measuring everything you can on them, the, their cells, their genes, their proteins, and so forth, and just testing how is their immune system changing over time. And it comes from a fundamental question that drives my own research, which is basically how, if you went to a doctor and said, how's my immune system doing, is there an answer for this, right? So this idea that if you can actually quantify the baseline, uh, it would have a relevance, uh, came from this study where we, by tracking people, we can quantify what we call an immune age. Uh, and once you actually capture that information, you can start predicting a lot of information that's missing from clinical records and doesn't appear in genetics because basically the immune system is all about tracking your life history and that, uh, that kind of is only captured in that uh, way. So you know, we're taking this now to the next step. We've uh, kind of in partnership with uh, several other people. We're setting up a nonprofit called the Human Immunome Project to measure the immune system across the world. And I think that is the baseline of how we should be thinking about disease. We know the information about people. We know how we can place you on a trajectory uh, of kind of the population of how your immune system changes, and that's gonna drive the first step. The second point is imagine we have this data, right? Imagine we had this data and how would this change how we, we do diagnostics today? And there comes an idea that uh, we've been developing at Cider Reason. Uh, basically, we call this computational disease models, but really, I think the nomenclature people are using now is foundational models of disease. Imagine you had uh, a, a molecular representation of disease and subtypes of the disease and so forth at, at the, you know, at your, uh, at, and, and ready for anything that you do from a decision maker perspective. We're already using this with pharma to develop drugs, prioritizing targets and indications and so forth, but what if this sat at the basis of every uh, diagnostic machine, knowing exactly what the parentheses are on or any kind of test, knowing when the patient that actually gets sampled, which endotype or subpopulation it is. We just heard it about it in sepsis. This can happen in every disease, I believe. Uh, and so I think those are two places where we're going now. Be really uh, going to change fundamentally how we're thinking about diagnostics. Definitely. And I would like to, to tie the conversation as well a little bit to the four prior panels that we had today. And we've heard from patients, from providers, from payers, from hospital directors that they consistently have been asking for diagnostics that matters, that are easy to use, that are easy to interpret in the clinical practice, that have demonstrated value, and that have health economic impact. That's a very challenging wish list, but this is what has to be true for us to deliver the impact that we want. So, um, Andy, I wanted to ask, considering all these requirements, how do we innovate within this ecosystem that is converging to realize that this is what needs to be true for diagnostics to be not only impactful, but to get to the patients as fast as possible? Yeah, no, it's a great question. Um, so I think first is starting with, as you, as you asked, what's really most important to the patients and um, what's critical to get right? And um, we had a few examples today of, of folks talking about their journeys with cancer. And if any one of us or any family member of ours undergoes um, a biopsy to get the definitive ground truth diagnosis of is cancer present, yes or no, they want all those things from the answer. They want to get it quickly, accurately, uh, trust the first opinion they get, and to really have that be the bedrock to guide future treatment decisions. Um, and I think it would be surprising to, to many people to realize how far we are from being able to offer that for routine cancer diagnosis um, based on because of just how difficult the task is that um, the, the core ground truth way cancer is diagnosed, it's not a molecular test, it's not methylation, it's viewing microscopic images. As Rob Monroe showed a beautiful example that he compared to the interpretation of a painting, and he said, you know, if you show this image, this complex image to any pathologist, and they will see many different aspects of it. But in the same way, there's tremendous variability in the interpretation of paintings, um, you know, which may uh, have some impact. But variability in the interpretation of these images has tremendous impact on each patient. Um, so one is address a really important unmet medical need, which is higher quality and more efficiency in the bedrock diagnosis of diseases like cancer. And then, you know, is there actually a technical solution to this? Uh, and this is an area where, you know, recently there is. And we've heard a lot about AI and different applications of AI. There have been uh, recent big advances in language. but. 
Advances that now go back about a decade go to really the first recent big wave in artificial intelligence, which was the huge advance uh, that started in about 2012 timeframe in deep convolutional neural nets, where for the first time, computers became very, very good at interpreting images. So at Path AI, uh, we've been working over the past seven years on how do we apply this, uh, this version of AI optimized for images to be able to interpret these microscopic images of tissue biopsies to enable patients to have accurate, reproducible, precision diagnoses to really guide uh, subsequent treatment decisions. Um, and then from a tool Butte's talk, for example, we saw how the data from the pathology report then becomes the ground truth that then goes into things like large language models and becomes the basis for recommendations that that form of AI can use uh, to guide a patient. But what if the data on that report is wrong? And that's what we hope to do with ours, with the ground truth bedrock information, um, is to use the, the power of AI, the power of cloud computing and the internet, which are widely available um, and building off of a set of technologies that are widely available, including in Rob Monroe's talk, um, all of the histology equipment, the digital image scanners, and now finally we have this powerful analytic engine that is widely distributable, and while experts themselves are not widely distributable, and there's just a few of them who can see a very finite number of cases per day, these AI systems are super scalable with very low marginal cost once they're built. So we really think that's the technical solution to solve this fundamentally important problem in cancer diagnostics. Thank you. And, and when, when we think about, <clears throat> again, innovation, and innovation to bring diagnostics, as we were talking before, at the right speed, in the right context, the right quality, sensitivity, specificity, all the criteria that we all know, it's, it's, it's what needs to be true for, for this, um, test, and, and now we think about the actual investment that we are putting into the diagnostic development compared to the investment that goes into drug development. I think it's around 100 orders at least of magnitude different, one versus the other. Yet, without having precision diagnostics, we cannot truly tailor the treatment for patients. So, um, Anthony, I would like to start with you, but I would love to get the, the input from the full panel What's the current status for investment in the diagnostic industry, and what can we do? What, what needs to change? Of course, we need to change. We need more investment. But how do we drive attention and focus in more investment in diagnostics? Yeah, so I, I think it's fair to say that um, diagnostics create a tremendous amount of value in the healthcare system, but monetizing that value has traditionally been somewhat hard. And as a result of the last 10 years, I think it's fair to say that most of the life sciences investment groups especially in early stage startups, are doing less and less diagnostics. Um, I'm actually optimistic about where it goes, but let me just give a little bit of context. Um, so I spend a good amount of my time at GV, or formerly known as Google Ventures, and it's a VC fund that invests about 1.5 billion per year, and it's split between tech and life sciences. So about you know, a little more than half the team are tech investors who go out and sort of talk to tech companies that do software, and then there's also a life sciences team. And I always had this really funny experience whenever I go talk to my friends that are the tech investors. And we say, like, the two best areas in life sciences investments are drug development and payer provider. And so then we start explaining our investments. And so let's start with a drug company. And you say, and, and they just look at you like, okay, wait, so you're going to build a company that has no revenue for 15 years, and then there's going to be a binary event. <laughs> and this is what you're excited about? <laughs> like, why are we doing this? It, it just, you know, they just look at you like this is madness. Or then you, know, you start uh, talking about the payer provider world and they're like, oh, okay, this is software. I'm gonna understand this more. And you get into all of these perverse incentive structures and regulatory environment and success is almost never about the quality of the software or the product or the technology, but it's really about sort of being able to navigate these very perverse incentive structures. And again, they're like, I'm not gonna show up to your deep dives. Now, I've had a curious experience, and it took me a long time to understand what's going on, is every so often I'll talk about a diagnostics company, and invariably, the tech investors actually get excited and want to hear about it, and they start paying attention. And, and in fact, even a lot of the diagnostics companies that have been funded in the last few years, let's say Grail, um, were funded a lot often by tech investors. And there's, it took me a little while to figure out what was the thread that they were sensing and, why, and I think they actually see something that a lot of um, life sciences VCs have missed. Tech investors are used to kind of complicated business models where you have so-called multi-sided markets. So if you think about, let's say, a company like LinkedIn, we get it for free as professionals, 
you know, we make relationships with each other. We're the user, but we're not the customer. The customer is often HR departments who buy subscription who want to recruit us. You could say the same thing about Google and Facebook, where we're users, but we're not the customers. The customers are advertisers. And so there's an interesting set of diagnostic company business models that started with Foundation Medicine, which was a company that GV invested in. Uh, it was actually the first deal I ever worked on, uh, and continues to get today in really visionary companies like Keras, where they sell a diagnostic, and that's a good business. But then there's another side of the market, which is selling the data to pharmaceutical companies. And there's a third side of the business, which opens up trial recruitment. And you think about some of the new chemotherapies that are coming down the line, often very rare mutations, same thing with in vitae and rare diseases. And so being able to kind of create these multi-sided markets where you're both selling to healthcare systems, selling to pharma, working with CROs, I think there's a very special opportunity there. It's just taken the life sciences investment community a little while to understand it. Because honestly, we're, we're just simple country VCs. We're used to selling widgets. Um, not, you know, not this complicated business model mumbo jumbo. Thank you, Anthony. And David, you have spin out several companies in diagnostics. So what are your thoughts and how do you think we, we, what can we do to incentivize much more investment in diagnostics? Well, look, I, I think that there's uh, certainly, as uh, Anthony said, opportunities to, to get uh, continued investment in diagnostics. There's, there's, we heard earlier today just tremendous amount of uh, excitement with respect to what the prospects are for these new technologies. But I think fundamentally it all comes back down to reimbursement. Uh, patients value the therapeutic. Um, the reimbursement process uh, oftentimes is, you know, has the entire uh, 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 protocol or th and therapy sort of baked into the reimbursement. And, and so, you know, when patients connect to improvements in their health, they think about the drug, they think about the therapeutic. So I think there's systemic problems for how diagnostics are both perceived and valued, but I, I think with, you know, Anthony's example of something like foundation medicine, where there's lots of different uh, touch points for uh, creating revenue value, uh, I think that that, that model is changing. Yes. And and, and to continue with you, David, actually you were talking about um, reimbursement and we've heard as well during today's presentations that the speed of innovation sometimes is, well, sometimes it's really going faster than actually we can adopt the novel technologies to make sure that these have adoption, the reimbursement and the impact to the patient. So uh, from your perspective, and we heard other perspective from the other stakeholders today, but from your perspective, um, having done research for many, many years and having a spin out uh, pioneer companies in the space, what can we do? Or what are the, um, I have a fly here. Um, what can we do? What are the options um, and strategies so that we can change the current system to drive adoption of innovation faster? And, and it's not only about technologies. We were talking and hearing about data and even data analytics, right? The speed of innovation at many levels is going really, really fast, yet we are not adopting at the right speed either. What can we do? Well, I, I think we heard a number of uh, speakers today talk about sort of the, the delays due to the regulatory uh, uh, nature of, of diagnostics. And I think uh, with, with the recent uh, FDA um, uh, ruling that uh, LDTs are you know, basically going to be eliminated, I think that that's going to put a, a significant damper on, on the process. Yes, I think we have to make sure that, that uh, diagnostic tests are accurate, they're diagnostic, they're, they're delivering the, the clinical benefit that, that they claim to, to be, be doing. But you know, I think uh, adding regulatory uh, layers here and making uh, LDTs become IVDs it, it is really going to um, uh, put a, a damper on innovation just because of the uh, delays in time and it's going to restrict the, the further restrict investment in, in this space. But, uh, you know, from, from a sort of technological research perspective, I think everybody would agree just you know, on the basis of what we saw today, there's tremendous potential in the, the uh, diversity of technologies that are available that are being brought to bear on diagnostics right now. And I think that, you know, this is the time to sort of double down 
and, and really uh, you know, pave, pave the way for, for making uh, these kinds of technologies, uh, uh, introducing these technologies in, in a much uh, smoother and, and, and rapid pace. Thank you, David. And by the way, I, we would love to open questions from the audience anytime. So if you want to chime in, please, please do so. Vanessa, if, if I can jump in on that, I have something, to, or at least a, a thought on this, uh, how to drive innovation forward and make some distinction. I think if you look at the history of, of innovation in diagnostics, a lot of it is about putting the measurement technology in place, and that requires a lot of buy-in to do it. Obviously, it's a difficult task. It's a, you know, has a lot of physical constraints. Uh, and then one needs to actually build the data set and so forth and get that buy-in. Uh, I think what we need to recognize is that that's just one type of innovation and that there's now opportunity for a different type of innovation. That one basically is much more on the usage of, or kind of more sophisticated usage of the data that comes out of those measurements, whether it's standalone by you know, kind of finding new insight in the data or connecting multimodal existing technologies together. And those, the, the, the pace in which you can actually uh, innovate on those should be much faster. And, and one needs to make that distinction. I, you know, Atul mentioned today something about you know, putting a chief AI officer. Mm -hmm. in a, right? uh, that is probably where every diagnostic company needs to be at this point. Uh, because basically there's, there's a huge amount of data generation. There's a huge amount of parameters that are coming off of these machines that nobody's looking at. Once you actually make those associations, the speed to actually innovate there, should, we, we should find a regulatory path in which this would be much faster. Okay. Yeah, and just to add on that, I think um, a huge driver of innovation will be exactly that. It's gonna be generating new insights from data that's just being ignored now, including in the one I mentioned, whole site images, as you mentioned, all of the data coming out that's just not being used because physicians aren't trained to use it, they're unable to do it based on our limitations, whereas new deep learning models, foundation models, can really turn that into new insights. And then it's really solving a user's need and having the products that really deliver, if they deliver higher quality at lower cost, you know, they don't necessarily need new reimbursement codes to get adopted, particularly if they're leveraging existing data. And then that begins to build the evidence base to then look for new, things like new reimbursement. So I do think leveraging data that's just sitting around is a huge driver of rapid innovation. Yeah, Anthony? I, I totally agree with everything you guys are saying um, about innovation and the scientific progress. I think it's also too important to discuss how change happens in medicine. So going back to my tech colleagues, I, I think there's this kind of meme that at some point medicine and healthcare will get quote unquote disrupted. And what happened with Uber and the taxi industry, which was very regulated, that kind of we're gonna bulldoze over the current state and some new generation of AI-enabled or data-enabled organizations will take over. I'm skeptical, um, and, and for the following reason. If you look at the history of medicine, medicine has had many technology breakthroughs. Um, sterile surgery, anesthesia, antibiotics, organ transplantation, cath labs, statins, chemotherapies, target chemotherapies. None of them disrupted the power structures of the day. You know, it wasn't like when cath labs came along that suddenly you had a new generation of cath lab-enabled hospitals. The existing hospitals just absorbed cath labs and brought in the technology. The things that have destabilized the power structures of the day are changes in reimbursement and regulation. And so I think really echoing what David said, the FDA changes on LDTs, I hope a good thing in the long run. I believe we'll have a profound change on the diagnostic industry as a whole, more so than, let's say, the advent of deep learning. Mm -hmm. No, I agree, and, and I just want to make an analogy that I'm not sure how valid it is, but I'm gonna make, make it anyway. Um, I'm coming from the pharma industry, and uh, in my prior organizations, I've seen a lot of efforts in the rare disorder space that has led to multiple stakeholders to really sit together and reinvent the paradigm for drug development. How do we truly develop, can we develop drugs for end of one patients? How do we truly change and accelerate access through novel regulatory pathways, thinking about rolling submissions to the FDA. So um, it would be very interesting to see how we can set up similar model in the diagnostic industry to reinvent the paradigm, because I think as we've been seeing through the day, as we saw from Ryaner's presentation, as we heard from everybody today, we all recognize that there are things that we need to change. So what 
how, how are we going to get started? How do we reinvent the paradigm? And I'm going to ask, actually, uh, the, the panel whether you are aware already of efforts that are going on, and if not, what, what can we do to start the conversation to say this is not sustainable? We need to change the way that we develop diagnostics. Sure, I do think there are a number of uh, efforts for important problems that multiple um, pharma companies agree are, are critical to support the drug development pipeline. I think FNIH has done a nice job of doing these um, pre-competitive pharma diagnostic company partnerships. Uh, we've also done partnerships with multiple pharma companies for critical diagnostic tools within drug development. But can I ask you, are those accelerating the path? Do you think? I think they're accelerating the path to development of the diagnostics in the sense of making large proprietary data sets available that wouldn't otherwise be available um, and sort of generating new value from, from each, both for the diagnostic company, but then the diagnostic product will, will produce value for um, the drug developers. So, so I think in these certain select cases, um, you know, these partnerships have been super important. Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe to add uh, at least uh, the type of stuff we've been doing with pharma and how I see this kind of progressing to diagnostics and payers. Um, you know, it, ultimately innovation starts with the places where there's less regulation uh, and uh, willingness to take risk. Uh, so, you know, we've started with pharma R&D. That's a place where there's a need for innovation uh, and there's, you know, the regulation isn't there yet. I think it's almost a necessity for a field to mature this way. So innovation starts with people who are willing, are willing to have that early adoption. And they talk to people who are more conservative. They sit down the line from this. They, they're already in the advanced clinical trials, or, and then it comes to the parents. And there are many ways the ambassadors to convince an innovation. It takes, you need to run through that process from the early adoption all the way, you know, it's not the early versus late. Within, obviously, within pharma, there's early adopters and late adopters. It's, within the process in which you're trying to bring something from, you know, from, from an idea to getting reimbursed. <laughs> uh, that, that, you know, you, you, it's very difficult to start there at the end. You need to take that process. And, and, and I think that's a bit of time, but once that process has gone through, uh, you've done it once, and, and you've, you've shown the proof points, I think that's gonna accelerate uh, this, the pace. Great, any questions yes, from the audience? Oh, sorry, David. Yes, I think one other, yeah, yeah, one other area I think that is important in this, uh, to, to, with respect to accelerating this, is just the availability of well-curated uh, sample banks. I think uh, you know this is this is a, a real uh, hindrance to developing novel diagnostics is the, the lack of availability of longitudinal samples from patients you know, over the course of their. Uh, lifetime essentially that requires you to to run you know another new prospective study that typically is underpowered uh, and and takes time to collect you know if we could have a, a sort of a national commitment to collect samples and bank them uh, for millions of people that would enable us to uh, us researchers you know when we have a new project to just pull samples out uh, as needed for particular indications and test hypotheses where, you know, this particular sample is not, you know, so precious because there exist thousands of other samples like it, I think that would really help catalyze this whole process. I, I really agree with David, and there's a, a theory of change I'd like to espouse here, and I'm going to take off my greasy venture capitalist hat on and put on my nonprofit researcher hat for a second. Um, something that Tool talked about earlier that I thought is very compelling, and I've heard this concept a few times, is the patient engagement component where patients, empowering patients to be more in control of their own healthcare. I think part of that is also going to be empowering patients to donate their data for medical research. You know, if you think about it, you can donate your blood, you can donate your organs, but there's not really an easy mechanism to donate your data. In many ways, that's what medicine needs the most is the availability of your data. And so you imagine as patients start taking more control of their healthcare, have better user experience in seeing their medical data, being able to say to them, would you like to consent for medical research? And then, you know, that data is suddenly in the public domain and, and can be used for a lot of different purposes. I really could foresee this opening up a wave of innovation in diagnostic development in particular. I'll put my nonprofit hat on as well. <laughs> so, 
so I mean, I'll mention, I mentioned this briefly before, the Human Immuno Project. So this is a nonprofit we've uh, been setting up that, that's driven with this idea that if you think about the immune system, but this is true for other fields as well, we've basically gone to the exhaustion of the existing methodology by which research can, can be done. So an, if it's an academic or a company to collect all the data that's needed to actually make a change, unreasonable to do this, right? The way to this forward requires some kind of a government, industry, academic partnership uh, to, 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 have to set that baseline of what, knowing what is, you know, what is the immune system, for instance, look like across the globe and all different ages and uh, uh, you know, pre-disease and, and, and how does that relate to response. So the initiative is basically, let's go and we, you know, we now have 15 years of the ability to now basically matured the tools to measure the immune system. Let's go and measure this now around the world, right? We've seen the impact of this in COVID. We basically got to the singularity point where AI is mature enough, the tools to measure the immune system are mature enough, and there's recognition that that's the, really the path forward. So, you know, I think in about high energy physics. Mm -hmm. High energy physics today cannot advance without CERN, right? Basically, physicists had to change their mindset at some point and say, well, we gotta pull, somehow pull things together to actually really make a change and advance ourselves. So I think we've basically reached that point, right? There's only so much that we can do without that data becoming yeah. a resource that people can leverage. You know? Yeah, and, and, and there is certainly a movement um, to think now about if data should be a public good. And we also heard from a tool today that there are many ways right now that patients can actually easily download, the, their, download their data. So we may be really at the beginning of a future that is gonna come really fast where data might be really accessible as much as we need it for, for advancing innovation. Absolutely. Um, oh. and, and, okay, great. So. We heard from, from uh, clinicians today that there was a overload of information, difficult to interpret, and if I look at the four of you, although I love you, do you, each one of you produces, are proposing enormous amounts of data to be interpreted, right? From genomic to proteomic with David, you know, immunome and multicolor pathology. So are we, are you, and how can we help you to really make sure that data interpretation in any application that you pull out is really not a barrier? Because it will be, right? Yeah, no, I think it's a great question. Um, so truly a lot of what we do is to use deep learning and AI as kind of as a filter to take what the, the incredible complexity of biology, and just to show the, refer to back the, the image Rob Monroe had, this is totally unstructured data where you're literally looking at hundreds of thousands of cells. So that's the information overload is the H&E stained image. Um, and then we're asking people to do things that are essentially impossible. Is there one cancer cell out of 100,000 cancer cells? Or are there greater than 10% cells that look like they have a little brown? Well, you can't count hundreds of thousands of cells, and this is the critical data type that's being used to make 100,000 and potentially life-saving therapeutic decisions. So there's a ton of information overload physicians are dealing with today, but with machine learning, you can actually abstract a lot of that task to the computer and say, look, you go and do what you're good at, which is counting 100,000 cells, tell me the answer, put that answer on the side of the screen, and then put a button, you know, agree, disagree, why did you come up with the score? So a lot of what we're building is taking the complexity of unstructured biological data um, coming out of these whole site imaging systems and reducing it to a format that the physicians can be more efficient, more accurate, um, and provide better care for patients. So definitely we're focused on the interpretation side to really solve that, that issue you raise. If I can uh, add to that, maybe I, I call this the data insight gap. Basically data has been growing exponentially in biology, insight grows linearly, every day looks works. Percent data utilized is lower. Uh, and I think the, the answer to this, this is what we've been doing in side reason, is basically investing a huge amount in the analytics side rather than the, the, the data generation. That's the revolution we need to do to actually even justify the generation of that data. Perfect. In the last minute, I know we have one more question. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if part of the uh, answer to uh, Vanessa's question about uh, the investment in diagnostics is actually in the way the diagnostics are defined and the goals there. What we heard from many, many different presentations today is one of the desirable outcomes, not just, you know, 
not just high positive predictive value and accuracy and precision, but we also want it to be inexpensive. We kept hearing cheap and fast, cheap and fast. That's an absolutely baked into what is a desired outcome for a, a good diagnostic. Whereas if you look at a therapeutic, that's usually not the case. Um, and the market will you know, reimburse whatever will be, uh, whatever the market can bear, which, which can obviously be uh, very, very high. So I'm, I'm wondering if that fundamental asymmetry is something that's uh, behind, you know, for example, the, the VC's uh, willingness to uh, you know, invest in the 15 year uh, to get the reward because it could potentially be so high as opposed to this very, very small amount of, of cash flow from, you know, a diagnostic that might just be $5 a test. Yeah. So I see David nodding. David, do you want to take this question? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I think it's a great question. It, you know, there, there has been a lot of discussion about data and a, AI today, but I, th I think it's important that we, we don't forget the importance of good data. I think Shai you know, might, might have gone uh, sort of the other direction with, you know, trying to do the, the processing. But I, I think, you know, there's still a, a huge need to discover and validate informative biomarkers. We can't simply, you know, continue to rely on data that already exists if, if we're going to push for precision. And, you know, what, what the uh, questioner just asked is, is, is exactly right. Ultimately, we want to achieve 100% sensitivity and specificity. That's that's the goal. Uh, so there rem remains a need, you know, not only to process the data but also to collect better data. And uh, you know, with with respect to the the comment about about the cost, I think that this is, you know, this is a, a real challenge because as we go into this multiomics, you know, whether it's genomics, proteomics, lipidomics, metabolomics, et cetera. Um, you know, each of those additional markers or modalities is going to require a, a sort of a multiplicity of, of tests. And, and if you're going to run three or four different assays, you know, you're not going to be able to do it for five bucks. So I think we have to be careful about, you know, how, how we implement uh, and how we select and how we collect the best kind of biomarkers so that we can actually deploy these things, these advanced diagnostic modalities and make them affordable and accessible to, you know, to, to billions, not, not you know, thousands or millions. Excellent. Just one quick thing uh, before we wrap up. I know we have to go. I, I think a lot of today has been focused on the challenges of diagnostics. I think we should close out with a sense of the opportunities. You know, something I often say to my team at the Broad is, you know, I often think, I wish I lived in the 1920s because that's when quantum mechanics and special relativity was being discovered. And that was just an incredible period in human history. If you think about what are people 100 years from now going to say, I wish I was alive in 2020. I think the convergence of molecular information and AI is truly the opportunity of our time. And yes, there's complexity because it's new and we haven't figured out the business models and we don't have the people in place. At the same time, like, there is nothing more exciting in the world than what we're all talking about today. Absolutely. Well, that's a very nice way to close the panel. Thank you so much. Who loves you? Thank you, everyone. <laughs>